you can't file a lawsuit to, you know, make the doctor be nice to you and listen to you. That's not how it works. And a lot of the big firms, most of them actually, you know, it never gets that far because it never gets to a lawyer because they have people that whose job it is to answer the phone and screen the calls and only make sure that the worthy cases even get to a lawyer. So I said, well, what do you do? You know, I don't know. We tell them, sorry, I can't help you. I wish, you know, but, you know, and they start calling other lawyers. So I decided that uh, there had to be a way, guys. There's got to be a way to, you know, try and help people who are in messed up situations uh, get through it uh, before harm occurs. And I started looking up this thing doing a little research on the internet and I find about I find out about uh, what they call patient advocacy. And this is probably around 2009, 2010. And I find out that there are people that used to work for hospitals and they used to work for doctors. They used to work in insurance companies, for example, but you know, they've made a career change and now they've decided I'm gonna go work directly for patients because I could use all the knowledge that I've gained uh, on the institutional side and use those skills to help other people. And I thought this is fantastic. You know, not only would it be cool to, you know, open this up to the world, it would also take a lot of burden and stress off of lawyers who don't know what to do. I, I just thought that the, you know, the possibilities were endless. So I want to like kind of make a long story short. I started locally with a local group. It kind of grew. I've got a partner and a really good friend of mine who I've known since high school, who's in high-end graphic design and uh, web development and um, product rollouts and things like that. Bottom line is he introduces concepts to people who don't know about him yet. I mean, that's what he's done his whole life. And we got together and figured that this would be a really, really, really cool thing for us to do to try and pull in these this new profession or field of patient advocates who, by the way, we're calling themselves all everything, you know, different, no matter where you go. You know, you may have heard of like, you know, patient navigators and, you know, health coaches and just all these names, depending on, you know, what program you have had taken or, you know, where you live. So that's my mission. Um, and that's what Greater National Advocates is. And I said in the beginning that I'm really glad to, you know, finally be talking to my peers, so to speak, because it's always been my goal to involve and make the disability, amputee, victim, survivor, community, whatever you want to call it, I believe that they are, we are crucial to the mission. And the mission is to provide services, advocacy, advice, consultation, in many cases, just a ear and validation. And in the case of limb loss, sudden limb loss, people are looking for somebody to connect with and answer questions. And that's why I'm so happy to be here because, you know, I could talk about it all I want but I wanna uh, take an opportunity to quickly, you know, show you what it is that I'm talking about, all right? So I have the ability to share a screen, right? You should have the ability. Let me know if you don't. All right. How do I do it? 
Okay, let's see. If you, if you move your mouse around on the bottom, there should be a little tabs that open up and there's a one that says share screen. Do you see that? Yeah, sorry. And then you'll click on screen and then share. You guys are, you can see this? Yes, no? No. Um, so if you clicked on the blue screen up in the top right mm -hmm. or the top left and then click on the share button in the bottom right. I'm sorry. Say it one more time. Oh, so do you see the little menu that pops up at the bottom when you move your mouse yeah. around? It says share screen. So we'll click on that green. Got it. Yeah. And then another window will pop up. And in the top left, it should say like there should be a blue box around screen. And then another button in the bottom right that says share. All right. Got you. Boom. There you go. All right. So really what I'm talking about is and again, I, I don't want this to be, you know, uh, this isn't a sales event or anything like that, but I just, it, it, it's always been, you know, real important to me to, you know, get you guys uh, involved and this is just such a cool opportunity for uh, me to introduce it. Um, patient advocacy by definition is pretty much helping somebody who uh, isn't able to help or advocate for themselves. Uh, somebody with knowledge of the system, knowledge about a particular condition or an illness, uh, knowledge about, um, you know, billing and insurance and, you know, what, uh, what is covered and what to expect. Most of the patient advocates that are listed on this website, which is gnanow.org. It's a nonprofit, start, went live about a year ago. Um, most of the advocates on here are um, nurses who have uh, retired social workers, discharge planners, uh, elder care professionals, geriatric care managers. And just so you know, um, uh, there's about 400 or so that are listed all over the country. Um, and I am going to, hold on, give you an idea of how it works. And let's just say we're looking for somebody who needs help with medical guidance. Give me a zip code, somebody. Anybody? 77059. So these are, as you can see, people who are uh, available. Let's just click on Angela because I know her, obviously Houston. They're all pretty much similar in that they, um, they help people and help patients and families get engaged and you know, make the right decisions and almost serve as like a liaison uh, between the patient who doesn't know what to ask and the physicians who most of the time know all of the answers, uh, but just don't always do the best job of communicating it. And it's not a slam, it's just reality. So I don't know if I should keep going here, if I, if I should answer questions. I mean, I, I really like uh, dialogue. Um, but I will just say that what I've what I've tried to do with greater national advocates is take all of the people that have this knowledge, who are trying to, you know, market and sell themselves independently all over the country, and give them uh, a singular place where we could obviously inform the public about what it is that an advocate even is, 
Uh, but I'm into phase two of that mission right now, which is trying to let people who don't even know that they could be advocates, they need to know that they are. And, you know, that's kind of where I'm going with this. Everybody here, you know, has had some experience. Most of us have had plenty of experiences that we could, and, and we love to give advice and we love to share experiences. I want to encourage everybody here to become a part of it and ask me questions and learn, you know, how to get involved. Uh, so I think that's my short story. I'd like to talk, open it up. Anybody have any questions or anything? I just stopped the screen sharing so we could get back to our gallery view. I could just say that I love that you're doing this and uh, I could have really used it, you know, when I went down six years ago and knew nothing about any amputees or quad amputees and it's a whole new world. And I had to fight insurance company very hard to try to get my electrics. So uh, just the fact that you're an advocate, I didn't have to sue my hospital or doctor because they saved my life and it was a little bit of a different circumstance than the doctors that didn't diagnose and they people did end up losing their limbs. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm glad you're out there, Bradley. Well, I want to say, Julie, first of all, that, you know, I think that the amputees, for example, have a lot that they could offer to other amputees. However, you nailed it when you started talking about the fact that, you know, you've, you've had a fight with insurance. Well, guess what? I mean, once you fight with insurance, it doesn't matter whether you're fighting over a prosthetic, prosthesis, or you're fighting over, you know, a bed or home health care. You still have to, you know, fight for it. You still need to learn the process. And there are just so many people out there that don't know it and would love to be able to connect with somebody that could. Um, and I have always thought, you know, this, this keeps, um, keeps me busy. Uh, it keeps my ear to the ground in terms of, you know, what's going on in healthcare. It puts me in touch and contact with a lot of different people. I'm trying to um, make it come full circle and bring patient advocacy into the institutional side of healthcare so that the people who are getting ready to send somebody home, and we'll, let's just use like RIC or Shirley Ryan or, you know, uh, the Houston facility or one of these big rehab uh, facilities, for example, nobody can do it by themselves. Nobody can. And I know that people are always out there looking for resources and support groups and everything, which is good if you can get to them. Uh, but I view advocacy as kind of a merging of a whole bunch of different professions. And most importantly, uh, advocates communicating with each other, uh, bouncing ideas off of each other and creating little teams that can help people. So I'm just a very strong, firm believer. And I know I'm preaching to the choir and it pains me to do it because I'm not used to doing it. And I haven't done it in a long time. And I've been specifically holding out in refraining from, you know, presenting greater national advocates to what I'm gonna call my peers because it wasn't ready. I needed it, I needed it to get built. I am not gonna use other uh, amputees as, you know, guinea pigs in the process. I've got a whole bunch of nurses, social, social workers, discharge planners, case managers, care managers, 
geriatric care managers all out there who all have tons and tons of experience. And I envision and imagine a time in the near future where I have survivors of trauma, amputees, chronic illness, survivors who are all incorporated into this uh, advocacy field, partnering up with, for example, the ones that have the credentials or whatever. I mean, the, the, I just think that the um, opportunities are limitless and I view it as such a win-win for everybody. I mean, for a lot of us, and for me, I mean, this is probably why I created the, the thing in the first place. It's, you know, we're looking for something to do. I'm, look, I'm always looking to talk to somebody on the phone. I can't wait for somebody to call me and ask me stuff. And they do all the time. And I get to now say, guess what, dude? Or guess what, ma'am? I can help you. Um, so it's kind of a little spiel that I'm going through here. Hey, Brad, and Nay has a question, I believe. Yeah, well, it's kind of a question, comment. Um, like you were saying how you don't want to like use the amputees as guinea pigs, but I think, I mean, we're a really important piece of the puzzle as well because, um, you know, we, we live the experience and just thinking about how things are done in Canada and the war apps, for example, they have an advocacy department that, um, you know, their kind of aim right now is crusade for change because uh, insurance companies need to be educated. And so that's why it is important for amputees to be involved in this as well, because they're part of that education, mm -hmm. um, education, education piece, but then you need people that are able to advocate too, because sometimes, you know, when you're at a disadvantage, it is easier to, you know, s shrink back when someone says, mm, well, no, that's not going to be covered. And Right, right. Uh, sorry, you're going to have to make do with leg A because it's cheaper, and mm. even though leg B is the one you want. And mm. so, yeah, it is really interesting. I just actually read a little piece from the Warhams. They talked about some of their advocacy uh, um, successes this past year. It was neat to hear uh -huh. some of their the fights that they've had with you know insurance and trying to influence policy and some of the successes that they've had in in doing that. So. That was just my comment, but I, I really respect what you're doing. I think it's really great. I want you involved. <laughs> What's up, Stumpy? I recognize you. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, man, it's been a minute. Hey, yeah. so on your on your platform there, um, the advocates, is it a fee for service um, or is it they're just going to give you some recommendations and things oh, like that. Great question. Thank you. That's why I wanted to open it up because you let me talk about all the stuff that I didn't talk about. So everybody is different. Let's just say that um, there are advocates on the site that have, you know, started their own businesses and they have three or four uh, other advocates working for them. There are other people who are full time in the daytime and they answer their phone at night and help people. And there are people who are, you know, it, it's a mix of everything. It really is what you want to make of it. You know, I started Greater National Advocates because, you know, a lot of people get so like hung up on the fact that, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I don't have a website. I don't know how to do this. I'm just saying, screw it. I'm not charging anything for anybody to get listed. I have pretty much, you know, this is what I'm kind of like trying to, you know, give to people a little bit here. So I would just encourage you guys to go to gnanow.org, you know, look around, see what it's all about. It is so easy uh, to sign up and it's really just like according to your skills. I mean, I'll show you, I'm going to give you an example of my first uh, prosthetic advocate. I don't know, Christy, you might, do you guys know Shri? Do you know Shri Thacker? Anybody? Yes, we, we know her. Yes, we do. Um, let me do this. I want to show you. The hell did I do? Here we go. Move your mouse around. <laughs> go to the bottom. <laughs> there you go. All right. Let us go to...
for example. So, um, she is, you know, my first foray into trying to bring people uh, into, you know, prosthetic uh, advice. And obviously, you know, she comes from the business side of it, but she knows a heck of a lot. I've, I've met her. I'm sure some of, uh, Stumpy, I know you probably met her at the, I, we were, you know, Amputee Coalition a few years back, I remember. Um, but anyway, that's an example of what... Sorry guys, I'm blind too, you know. All right, anybody have anything else while I'm messing around here? Well, what I was thinking was early on when you're in the acute phase and it's early um, in your recovery, you know, you're dealing more with maybe, you know, hospitalization and whether it's billing or, um, you know, I, I remember being in the hospital and trying to get a more comfortable bed because of the cubitus ulcers, bed sores, things like that that were happening. And you know, that they, the hospital administrators, they didn't want to bring in certain kinds of beds because they were like, well, you're going to get discharged in a couple of days anyways and stuff like that. So, you know, just learning that there are different people available in different facilities and being, you know, our own voice or having a family member or someone, you know, close by help, help us is always great. But later on, I think, fundamentally was the main thing that people deal with, you know, a year, two years down the road is coverage and what's covered, what's not covered, why isn't it covered? How do I justify the quote unquote medical necessity of an item that, you know, someone is saying, well, it's not medically necessary mm -hmm. or it has advanced features that aren't um, suited for me. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say it feels like every time I get a new pair of feet, they're uh, the K levels for the American system, um, they're K3 feet. And, you know, I'll get the return from the insurance company that says that's not a covered item because it has advanced features. And I'm like, it's a literal like for like item. Right. You know, it's not like I, I have a, a Corvette with, you know, monster truck tires on it you know i got a corvette with you know bf goodrich radials uh -huh. you know so uh -huh. it's, right. it's, i'm literally replacing the, the exact same part and then you got to go through the appeal and denial or denial appeal process and and Which understanding you and the technology. How, are you ultimately successful in the end most of the time right oh yeah 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 i i you know but it was definitely a process to learn, you know, um, early on, it was a little bit easier in the sense of that when, when I got sick in Southern California, I was in the Kaiser system and I, there were review boards that I could go to in person at my facility, my, you know, my nearest hospital and advocate for myself there. I would like to try or obtain, you know, such and such foot because I believe it will do this for me, you right. know? Um, and nowadays, you know, I mean, I've moved out of state. I'm in Tucson, Arizona. My insurance company has handed me off three times now. Now I'm with, um, you know, Medicare primary and Aetna secondary. And the review board might be, who knows, an obstetrician that's based out of Utah or, you know, Maine or somewhere else. And it's, it's all letter writing stuff, 30 days, 90 days for the response. Um, but understanding what they're basing it on in the American system, it's all on, on Medicare and CMS, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and the BPM, the uh, Benefit Policy Manual. Yeah, see? Um, Once you, you know, know and you know yeah. everything. <laughs> you got to learn the lingo. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you Brad. Learn the lingo. Hey, yes. Brad, I see that Bill Hodgman has his hand up. Okay. Hi, Bradley. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for doing what you do, Bradley. I've been looking forward to this uh, for quite some time. 
Uh, briefly, I, I'm a quadruple amputee as well due to sepsis since 2014. And in the last couple of years, I've become a certified peer visitor with the Amputee Coalition and able to contribute a little bit um, to, towards advocacy and want to get more involved. Um, so this is very good timing for that reason, as well as a second reason. Um, uh, I, I recently became employed. I'm gonna, <laughs> starting my first full-time job on Monday after uh, many years of, of not being employed. So I, I am on, uh, I have Medicare and because I was a severe victim of the great recession, um, lost everything financially and family wise and foundationally, I'm also on Medicaid uh, in my state of Delaware here. So I suddenly find myself in need of uh, possible advice regarding, okay, how do I handle the transition from Medicare to pri private insurance uh, and how do I, you know, negotiate or handle, you know, Medicaid on a more local level? Mm -hmm. um, so um, it seems to me that Medicare advice doesn't need to be localized. So I'm looking for the best advice through uh, GNAnow.org uh, or yourself, and also looking for more local advice. But didn't happen to see anybody in Delaware. No, uh, I'm going to tell you, there's a great uh, woman out of Massachusetts, and her name is Diane Savastano. And I consider her to be probably, um, I'd say, your go-to person for that question uh, right there. And I also, you know, when it, and you're right, because Medicare is federal. So, you, you know, um, it's like, I, I would call Diane. I mean, look her up. She's, she's awesome. Uh, would you mind spelling the last name? S A V A S T A N O. All right. Yeah. Change one letter and I got it. Thank you very much. Got it. Yeah. Am I right? Isn't that what she does? I haven't brought her up yet. I just typed her name into a, a word document. <laughs> okay, cool. So, you know, this is the hard sell to people. Um, getting the word out. Um, I think. I know I can do it. I know I can get the word out to the public, uh, but you know, the issue is it's like when you got uh, a country with 350 or so million people, that's great that I have 400 advocates. So I am rallying my troops here, people who have, you know, something to offer. And I don't know if it is appropriate for me to talk about this here, but I'm gonna do it anyway, um, because I don't know how many people are on, uh, you know, on disability uh, or, you know, are, have uh, work restrictions because of their amputations. But I do know that, you know, some people charge for these advocacy services. Some people give it away. Some people, it's a combination of both. But I just think for a lot of us out there, it is a way to actually do something good and be able to pick up a few bucks on the side. Uh, I did preface that by saying I didn't know that it was appropriate for me to say it, uh, but why the hell not? So I said it. Anybody have anything else they wanna ask me? Well, I have two specific questions and it might not even be appropriate for me to ask them. Uh, but I was just wondering, I went on Medicare a year and a half ago with the Blue Cross Blue Shield supplement. My myoelectric hands that were bought by a very generous patron are five years old and they're starting to break. Will Medicare buy me a new pair of hands if I could prove that I need these. I think so. I mean, I think in this case, you got to just talk to your prosthetist and make sure that, you know, that it's them. I think what you're going to have to show is that it's, you're due for an upgrade in five years. And my experience has always been the magic number, especially when it, even for a wheelchair, right? Am I wrong? I mean, uh, yeah. Five years, wear and tear, can't fix it, you know? I think you would be okay, but you know, be, between your Medicare and your Blue Cross Blue Shield supplement, which is the same thing that I have, I think you'll be fine. My second question, 
was I knew, I wanted a specialty licensed counselor that my doctor recommended for my own issues as an amputee, but uh, she wasn't listed with Medicare, only licensed professional social workers were listed. Yeah. And I filled out a, a um, appeal, but Medicare turned down my appeal and would not uh, okay her. So I had to stop using her because every time I went, it was $150. Mm -hmm. And yep. so, uh, do you see your advocacy group as being able to help me with something like that? Well, I would just say that, again, just my experience here could be wrong, but it just seems to me, you know, knowing the therapy that I've gone through and the therapy that I've made my entire family go through, uh, they tend to be self-pay. And, uh, you know, they tend to be outside of any network. So really the battle is getting the providers to accept Medicare as opposed to convincing Medicare to pretty much what you're saying is let you go out of network and have them pay reimburse, right? Yeah, she doesn't accept Medicare. Yeah, that's the issue. I mean, most of the, uh, the therapists uh, that I'm aware of for whatever reason, and I don't know the ins and outs, there must be some, they probably got sick of the same bullshit that you're sick of right now and said, screw it, um, pay me the 150. Right? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times, Julie, what happens is that it's cheaper for them to uh, just do cash from the customer because the medical billing side of the house and the reimbursement rates, um, they might reimburse you, but then they'll turn around six months later and do an audit and go, oh, yeah, we're clawing back all this money. So that's what happens there. And then as far as your hands and things like that, just keep making multiple appointments with your PCP and having it put in your medical notes that you need new hands because you know these are worn out, non-serviceable, out of warranty, and you're creating a paper trail for medical justification of, of this item. It doesn't matter that you had received those hands from a non-insurance person before. Um, you, you have an item now and you're just asking for that item to be repaired and or replaced. And what I'll do is I'll start about six months ahead of time with my primary, like with feet or any prosthetic. Any Anytime I go for a new prosthetic and I just go, look, these are the issues that I'm having. I'll write it down on a piece of paper. Well, I don't write it down. I type it out on a computer, but you get what I'm saying. So I just, you know, I'm, I make my notes and tell my primary, Put this in my medical record word for word because there are certain keywords um, that are beneficial that will trigger insurance coverage. Um, so a lot of times it's for lower extremities, I'll say things about, you know, I'm having residual limb breakdown and unable to correct that with sock ply management or other, you know, padding methods. For upper extremities, I'll say things like um, the current item is um, like the socket, basically. Uh, no longer fits my residual limb shape due to um, atrophying of, of the limb. Now, whether that's true or not, doesn't matter. You're just putting it down in your medical record. So you're, you're making a case for yourself with your primary care physician so that when insurance goes back and reviews your medical notes, they see that you've been bitching about this thing for the last six months. And it's not just something that, oh yeah, I want, you know, Michelangelo hand that's a hundred thousand dollar hand, uh, but I wore a body powered hook for the last 30 years, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's making, it's making that paper trail and making that paper trail long enough that you can point back in your record and because well, you know it's going to get denied so yeah. you know it's going to get denied nobody's you just want to be able <laughs> you, no. you just want to be able to say all right well um i've had this problem for the last six months and it's causing me not just physical distress but mental distress and i can't accomplish my my standard and normal adls uh for myself so 
it's it's things like that. Um, okay, instance, that's helpful. Yeah. Hey, hey Brad, so. Kim Steele has her hand up. All right. Hi, Kim. Hi there. Um, I uh, just wanted to uh, tag on to what Julie said. Julie, I've got the bionic hand, um, and I don't know what prosthesis you use or what uh, prosthetic company you use, but I know for myself with hanger, um, they always go and whether I need a new set of legs, um, I'm about to get fitted for another set of legs. Um, I have Medicare, Blue Cross, Blue Shield as well. Um, and I haven't had a problem. I haven't had a problem at all with getting my hand fixed or them wanting to get me something new. Um, I know Autobach has been having, and you might want to check into this because I just did a marketing campaign for them with the B-Bond it can. Um, you might want to reach out to Autobach themselves as far as your hand goes. Um, the, if you go on their website and click on where it's set where the Bee Bonnet Candy is, there's a form that you can fill out. Um, let them know the issues that you're having with your hands. I have um, the eye lamp. The eye lamp? Well, okay, well, even the eye lamp, they've got that one going on as well. Um, if you click on the eye lamp as well, they have a, a, another box for that one as well. Put in there the issues that you're having with your hand. Um, your processes should be also helping you get you whatever you need. And I know with Hanger, if there's any out of pocket, they let me make payments on it. And they also write some of it off to where I don't have to pay that full out of pocket. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, you can reach out to me. I'll help you any way I can um, and get you the information that you need. And also, as far as your therapist goes, um, is it Medicare that denied it or Blue Cross Blue Shield that denied it? Medicare, because, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield supplement won't pay anything unless Medicare pays at least one dollar. OK, you might want to check with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, I had that same issue with mine. And all I did was make a call to them and um, I can help you with that as well. Um, and let you know what I did to, to get that going to where they will accept the therapist that you're wanting to see and you not having to pay out of pocket for that, that service. Good. That's great news. So just, you know, get, uh, set up a time with me um, and we can FaceTime or whatever. And I can get you, you know, everything that you need for that. And I, I don't mind doing that at all. Okay. But I want to thank you um, for doing this uh, Zoom meeting. It's very helpful. Um, there needs to be, and I'm working, I'm also a certified peer visitor with the APT Coalition. And they're doing, uh, and I'm working to start doing more stuff here in Georgia as far as getting these bills passed to where we have better access to the equipment and all of the things that we need to function on a daily basis. Um, that's so important. And I think um, I applaud you for what you're doing. Um, and I truly appreciate what you're doing. And if there's anything that I can help with, don't hesitate to reach out to me as well. I'll be glad to help any way I can. Well, and, that's all, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> How did I do? <laughs> Just fine. Yep. Did awesome. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Julie. Thanks everybody for joining. And Brad, um, what is there anything else that in you close, in closing? I would just encourage you all to write it down or type it or or go to it. But you know, I would love to have feedback. And I've said it more than once that you guys are you know, my last audience, because I think you're, you know, I, I didn't mean to use the word, you know, guinea pig or anything later. It's just like, I wanted to introduce it when it was ready. 
and I think it finally is. Uh, and this is a really, really good, small, tight group. Uh, I know many of you, not really from personally, but at least from, you know, seeing you pop up in various locations, either in person or on the internet. I want to introduce the concept of independent patient advocacy to you and let you know that you already are independent patient advocates. And if it would be something that you're interested in, I would welcome you to you know sign up, talk to me, call me, learn more about it. Um, just like we are certified, a lot of us uh, as peer visitors, um, patient advocates also have board certification that is available right now. And it's really just a couple of years old and it's kind of growing. Uh, and again, without being salesy or, or anything, I just think it's a perfect merging of worlds. Uh, what, what we could offer to the, uh, to the advocates out there that, you know, just come from a healthcare background, but don't have the real life experiences and vice versa. Um, it's just a great way to, uh, try and pull teams together and make sure that bad shit doesn't happen in a hospital. That's the bottom line. So that's my mission and I'm sticking to it. Rock on with your bad self. All right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I encourage anybody here to reach out. I'm sure, I don't know if you guys are on an email chain and everything. I'm going to definitely start staying a little bit more involved uh, with y'all than I have been. I've been busy, but uh, I'm easy to get a hold of. I welcome any questions, comments at any time. And thank you, Sean and everybody else for giving me the opportunity and yeah I can attest to Brad being easy to get a hold of so um he's very responsive by email or text if you ever need anything but um I yeah I'm I'm grateful for you to provide this information and you know for others or you know let us know how we can help and get the word out um it's the you know it's the same thing with enhancing skills for life it's it's so interesting when I see stories of other people, whether it's um, a medical malpractice or not, in individuals missing both arms or all four limbs, how do we get them to find out about Amputee Coalition? How do we get them to find out about Enhancing Skills for Life? How do we get them to find out about Greater National Advocates? So it's just hard to... to break through. Yeah, break through. And, and, and you know, social media has helped a bit because people can type in certain keywords and find a website or find a group, um, social media or, or internet. But it's just, it's so interesting to figure out how to break through and get the word out about the different uh, resources that are, that exist and that are out there. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, and the meeting is recorded. So I, I missed the first part, Brad, where you were introducing yourself and giving your background and your story, but um, I got the majority of it. I got, you know, a good 50 minutes of it. I just missed the first five minutes. Sorry about that. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Brad. Thank you. Thank you.